my name is Sakshi and I am a part of the LONCON team. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, for those of you who are new, uh, Nalcon Security Conference is a unique platform for security enthusiasts and professionals to showcase their research and technology to the community. Uh, we have our upcoming uh, event, Nalcon Goa 2022, happening on the 9th and the 10th of September. The focus of the conference is to showcase the next generation of offensive and defensive security technology. And in addition to that, we also have announced uh, 15 hands-on training sessions. So you can check them out uh, on our website in, in case you're interested. So coming to our today's uh, speaker, we have with us Chizier Pidzi. Uh, Chizier Pidzi, who is a security researcher, analyst, and technology enthusiast. Uh, he develops software and hardware and tries to contribute to the InfoSec community. Mainly focused on low-level programming, he develops and contributes to open source software such as Volatility, Open Canary, uh, Cetus, and many more. Uh, Chizia sometimes also develops and contributes to hardware related uh, to interface uh, some real world devices and sometimes not. Uh, doing a lot of reverse engineering, he has given some amazing presentations in different conferences such as DEF CON, Black Hat, Insomni Hat. So on behalf of all of us, I would like to welcome our today's speaker and without any further delay, uh, we can start with the session. Thank you. Thank you, Sakshi. Thank you for the nice presentation and thank you for having me today. And thank you also to everyone who joined us. And uh, let's uh, go immediately into the presentation so that uh, we will not... Uh, okay, let me share. Okay. I think you should see my slide deck here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, so let's start immediately uh, with, uh, okay, this is the title of the presentation, obviously, but you, I, I think uh, you already know it. And okay, a couple of words about me. Uh, I am a reverse engineer and security researcher at Solid Lab. Uh, Solid uh, is an Italian company. And uh, I, as, as Sakshi already said, I'm doing a lot of open source, uh, source security related things. So if you want to have a look to make GitHub, uh, this is the address. I, I leave also all the coordinates at the end of the presentation. So uh, you can have a look and uh, maybe get in touch with me, whatever, uh, if you think that uh, you, you, you may want to discuss with me some, about something. Okay, so let's uh, jump immediately into the presentation and uh, with a quick intro, what we are speaking about today. Uh, as I said, we are going to speaking about uh, emulating uh, uh, binary emulation, emulation software. And uh, the first thing I want to uh, tell you is that uh, how emulation is different from the usual sandboxing. There are a lot of differences to be honest. And uh, uh, I just uh, want to make one big difference here just to make things a bit clearer which is okay with sandboxing. And when I speak about sandboxing, I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, Cuckoo, Epen Iran, uh, Joe Sandbox. So that, that kind of software, you are actually, uh, you have a complete operating system running uh, your malware or where you are detonating your malware. With emulation, we have a different situation because we don't have actually a complete um, operating system behind, but we are creating a fake one, let's say, uh, instrumenting our binary, our executable, in thinking that he has um, an operating system behind, and which is the great, the great advantage here is that uh, you can instrument uh, this this emulation and have more interaction with the software itself. And this is where emulation, let's say, rocks uh, instead of using uh, sandboxing. And I will show you how in the presentation. Couple of words about tooling. So the tools we will use today. And uh, these are the two tools we we'll use. One is a well-known uh, reversing tool, which is Ghidra. I'm sure you know it. And another one is a tool I wrote, which is Risploit. It's an emulation engine based on Unicorn and Speakeasy. What I want to say is that I'm using Risploit today because I know it very well since I did it. But uh, what we say today is not uh, linked to the tool. So you may want to use the same concept uh, with other tools, there are other tools other than uh, Risploit uh, out there. So you may want just to reapply what we speak, uh, uh, what we are speaking about uh, with your preferred tool. I'm just using this because it's more convenient for me. 
Uh, if you want to have a look to the complete tool, then uh, there is also a quick video on YouTube, uh, not very quick, it's uh, one hour more or less where I'm presenting all the functionality of the tools. If you want to have a look, uh, you can uh, give it a, a watch to, to it. But uh, today we will not speak about the tool itself, we are speaking about the technique and the concepts. Uh, a couple of words before starting about Resploit. We have some files. Resploit is a Python based uh, um, engine. So we have some files uh, that we'll probably modify during our presentation because we want to, as I said, interact and uh, uh, doing some, in some, some instrumentation with the malware we are emulating. And so we will have a look to two, three files uh, we, uh, for the, of the tool itself, uh, which are where the configuration are set as, uh, uh, for example, in this, in this one, or uh, uh, where you can set Yara rules uh, or emulate the payload. Okay, I'm sorry, I just exited the, oops, sorry. Oh, Lord, I hit the wrong button. But okay, so let's start uh, with case number one. Uh, case number one, it's uh, a very simple uh, shellcode uh, got from, uh, from an Excel macro. Uh, this is the Excel macro. This is coming from an ex a sample sent to me by a user of the Resploit, and I thought it was a good uh, a good sample of how it works. So um, this is a very simple macro in Excel. Uh, as you can see, there is an um, uh, array loaded with some bytes. Then this array is uh, used for a virtual allocation, uh, and it is copied in this, uh, in this virtual alloc, and then there is a create thread uh, function here below. So that means that in some way, this uh, uh, is, uh, I'm sorry, uh, this is going to, um, let me show it again. This is going to execute this code. Okay, that's pretty clear. Uh, but how emulation can help us in this? So let's go in our tool here. I'm just running the, the tool itself. Resploit has a CLI uh, interface where we can run commands. It has several commands, but today we will focus only on one, which is emulate payload command, which has a different, some different options uh, in it. From Resploit, you can also run shell commands. So you can just locate, uh, for example, I saved the, that, uh, that uh, binary, uh, that array we saw before in this file. And so I'm just starting the emulate, emulation of, his, of it, just specifying the file with the dash p option. So I'm going to, for example, starting the emulation of this software. So it's just a matter of running this command into the tool itself. And we see that, okay, let me just add another option, which is Anuk. It is just to speed up performances. I'm not going into the details, but if you want to have, there is all the documentation. Okay, we can see that uh, some things are happening here. Because, for example, you see that, uh, okay, the execution has been started and we are tracking API. Uh, Resploit automatically detects that this is shellcode. It's not an XA or a DLL, but uh, it automatically detects the, the kind of uh, code he is, is managing. And we see that there are some things done, like a create process with a create suspended flag. That means that there is a new process created and uh, it is not immediately executed. Then there is a, an additional virtual alloc done into the process. The process is named, as you can see, run DLL32. And uh, then there is an additional write into this process. So there is a kind of injection running. So these are all things that emulation or in this case, API tra tracing is uh, telling to us. And then uh, there is a cre create a remote thread. So it means that there is another execution of additional codes here. So it's not directly done by this code here. And then there is a slip. Then uh, you can see that uh, the process is repeated again and again and again. So we are interested actually right now into this first part. For example, this slip is a, another effect of emulation is not really uh, done because I can see this, you, as you can see, the slip is done uh, for a very um, amount, very high amount of time, but we are actually skipping this because this is one of the advantages of the emulation. You can instruct your API in doing what you want instead of just relying on what uh, is doing uh, your um, virtualized environment. So what we can do right now with uh, our tool? Okay, we saw that we have this create remote thread. If we go back in uh, the emulate payload help, we can see that we have an option dash T, which is dumping the create thread, create remote thread API content. So what we can do right now is just to re-execute again the same code by passing this option. 
here. And we can see that uh, we have exactly the same situation as before, but uh, uh, with an additional uh, set here because this code has been dumped into this file. Okay, let's have a look on what uh, this file has uh, in it, just to understand if we, okay, we see that uh, some bytes, which looks like other code. So, okay, great. That's a uh, good things to, uh, to, to know. And so let's just start to uh, emulate that code again. So we are just doing the same thing. Okay. And uh, again, with the dash option. So again, we are starting the emulation, but this time on the create thread. And we see some different things happening because there is, for example, here uh, an, another emulation done with uh, the API tracking. And we see, for example, the execution of uh, uh, an internet open on this site here. Then there is a download of a, 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 a file named metal.exe. A local file has been created here with a create file Chrome exe, and then this Chrome exe is executed here. So after the download completes. So this is a pretty uh, a nice overview of that shellcode done in two commands in a few minutes, as you see, as you saw, a few minutes, uh, four or five minutes we did it. Um, okay, you may think and you may ask, okay, but I can obtain the same uh, the same thing just with uh, a sandbox, which is true and no, I will show you why. Because for example, if I get the same, uh, the exact the same file and I will put it, for example, on up in Iran, I obtain something like this, which is in, parts similar because you see that Excel is running, for example, a run dll32.exe file, which is actually what we saw. And, uh, but we see something different here if you look into the details because we don't see any kind of HTTP request and any kind of uh, connection, but you just see a uh, DNS request, which is uh, exactly the same, uh, the same uh, site we saw. What has happened here? And why in this case, Appen Iran didn't found everything about the, emula the, 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 the execution because the shiny objects.birds was not uh, resolved correctly. And this is one of the advantages in this case of emulation, because you can actually instruct your emulator in doing things, even if they are not uh, really happening. So in this case, uh, which is very common, this case, because when you analyze uh, malicious software, very often you have uh, the command and control brought down in a few days. So it's pretty normal that uh, a site is not responding. Uh, you miss uh, an important part of the of the execution because you don't know which kind of file has been downloaded and which uh, has been saved. So in a incident response situation, this is pretty important to know. So you can see here this one of the advantages of emulation. So you can really uh, instruct your emulator in doing things uh, you want. So like in this case, uh, emulating a connection to the uh, to the domain server here, shiny objects.birds, which is not actually happening, for example, in a standard, let's say, sandbox. Okay, so what we, let's go back into the presentation. And, uh, okay, what we can see, okay, is this is what we learned from, uh, from, our, from our emulation. So we got an Excel macro with a virtual alloc, a move memory, and a create thread. Then we emulated the shell code and we saw that there was an additional create process, a virtual alloc, a write memory, and an additional create remote thread. After that, we dumped that content and we did an additional emulation again. And we saw that there was a con internet connection and a download of a file with the execution. So this part was pretty missed, what was almost missed by the uh, sandboxing, but it was in, in, instead uh, uh, identified by our emulation approach. Okay, let's jump to case two. Case one was a very simple case. Okay, very simple shell code, no obfuscation, no encryption, nothing uh, at all. So the basic one, let's say. But now we are going into uh, showing you how emulation can help you in doing really hard stuff and different, uh, different uh, uh, kind of analysis. Uh, this is a DLL, not a shell code anymore. Uh, a DLL, which is uh, uh, assigned to run it uh, uh, malware in this case, depending on the tool you use to analyze it. Uh, sometimes this DLL is also um, linked to Bumblebee. Uh, it depends on which tool you use to, to analyze it. But okay, it's a pretty recent uh, piece of malware. I downloaded it uh, the last month, so beginning of May, probably. And uh, so something that is 
in the wide array right now, and uh, it can be used as a, a, a sample. So let's go into the demo right now. Okay. Um, before starting with the emulation uh, of this one, I would like to show you, as I said, we will use Ghidra, how this DLL is uh, built. Okay, this is the analysis done in Ghidra without any comments. I left it on purpose uh, done in this way because I want to show you how emulation can help you in uh, figuring out what is going in to happen into the, the executable. So the emulation itself, uh, okay, starts from here. The, sorry, the, the, the executable itself starts from here and you have an entry point. Then we can see here the, the compilation, which is a simple function. We can try to drill down. For example, we see some further function here. We can have a look to them. We start to see some uh, API calls, uh, which do something, some virtual allocation, but okay, mm, we are not interested in there right now. Let's try to dive in and to the rabbit hole here and seeing uh, that things are becoming pretty complex. So, uh, okay, you still see other function calls until, for example, this one doing other things, get the module handle, uh, additional call. I want to bring you to a specific part because I want to show you, for example, a specific function call which is the um, uh, this one because why it's the, it is interesting this one because uh, let me show you okay this is the uh, flow generated by Ghidra about this function it is pretty uh, common when you have a look uh, to obfuscated malware uh, this is a sample of control flow flattening where you can see a lot of uh, loops uh, and uh, generated uh, into the, the, the file itself. So let's say we want to figure out what this is doing. We can do it manually or by doing static or with emulation. Okay, let's go back into our emulator. And uh, okay, we can just start emul emulation of the sample by doing uh, the same things uh, as we did before. So emulate payload, Dash P, in this case, I have to use the sample DLL. Okay, and then I use also this one. Okay, I'm trying to run it and it says, okay, this is a x86 uh, DLL. It does not have any exports. And okay, it's a very important information for us. Uh, so you can try to just execute it with this export here because uh, um, this is the at process attached. So let's say it's executed every time the um, DLL is registered. So let's just follow our, the, the, the hint that Resplit gave us and let's start it. Okay, great. We see something similar than before. We see that uh, uh, emulation starts, then uh, there are some um, API calls. Then there is a specific call to map view file and we see an error. I left it this on purpose because I want to show you why emulation is different. Okay, what is happening right now? Uh, we see a, a call to this map view file, which is an API call, which get a specific file from the file system and maps it into memory. Okay, great. Uh, but this is failing for some reason. Uh, and the reason is that uh, it says that the file path is, is not found. That's uh, why, uh, I, why this is happening. Because as I said, there, we don't have a, a real operating system behind, but we have uh, something emulating the, this. And so what we need to, go ahead with our emulation is to provide this file if you want to analyze it. So in this case, uh, what we should do, it's just to copy the DLL into the um, proper directory. And I'm going to do it immediately with a specific command, which is this one. Okay, so I can go back in my, in my respect and then re-execute again the thing, okay? Okay, as you can see now, the, uh, I'm stopping it because otherwise uh, it takes a while. Uh, the part of the mapping of file went ahead and uh, okay, it started to do some other things. Great. So uh, we, we can now go, go on and understand what is going on. So let's go back in Ghidra because I told you before, I want to really understand what this function is doing. And it would be quite hard to do because it's not really, uh, really easy to read this kind of uh, flattening. What can I do is, for example, have a look to the compilation here and seeing that, uh, okay, there are a set of while loops, great. Then there is a kind of, uh, let's say, let's call it state, state machine, because as you can see, there is this local 54 variable used every time here. 
And depending on the value that this, uh, this variable has, it's doing different things. Okay, if we look at the code here, we see that this local 54 value is mapped to register A, uh, e, uh, AX. Okay, so what we can do to help us in understanding what this function is doing? I thought something like that. I can just, for example, place something at the very beginning of this set of loops here, telling me which is the content of the EAX register at this part, in, the, in this part, in this moment, so that I can completely unroll the execution and understand which are the steps and in which order they are executed. How can I do it with emulation? It's pretty simple, to be honest. And uh, I just have to go to modify one of the files uh, we saw before, which was the uh, emulate payload. This uh, file, has a section which is very well uh, um, commented here where you can insert your own code. And uh, for example, it's show you an example because uh, you can set the begging variable which contains the current instruction pointer and then do something you want. So what we want to do, we want to check when the address is this one. So it's uh, uh, this value here, the 32B6. We want to print, for example, the content of the EAX register. And uh, it is very simple to do it because it's just a matter of adding a couple of line of codes there where the comments is set. So let's just go back and let's just to insert, try to insert this one. Okay, as you can see here, I just checking the content of begging, which is for example, this value, which is the one we see here. Okay, every time the, uh, this instruction is reached, I want to print out the content of the register. Great. So let's save and go back in our execution. So what is happening here? Uh, I'm just rerunning it. Oops, I did an indentation error, sorry. So, oops. Uh, Okay, so I copy probably, so yes, there is a missing space. So let's go back. Okay, so what is happening right now? It's, uh, I have to remove this option. Oops. Okay, here we are. Okay, so you can see that when the, that, uh, that part is reached, we see that there is this print. So that means let's, have a, let's run it a bit more so that you can see, okay, something more. You can see that there is a kind of initialization of that loop running, uh, for example, several parts of the, of the loop itself. And then there is a kind of uh, actions repeated for several times, doing every time the same things. So it looks like that he's running a kind of a loop into the set of loops, doing some things here, okay, and passing every time into the same places of the of the loop itself, and then running a string compare. Great. This string compare it's running on several things, and uh, it looks like that it's looking for this anti-protect virtual memory. So this is giving us some insights actually. So it, it looks like that this that function is in some way before mapping a specific NTDLL, okay? And then now it's trying to find out this, uh, uh, this function here by following this kind of approach here. We are not interested right now in going to the detail of, of uh, every single step here, but we are just not interested in the last one because at one point this, will, this loop will end because this match will be correct, okay? So let's try to jump uh, at the last uh, uh, part of the, of, the, of the loop when this uh, compare is actually successful, okay? So to do it, uh, I can just uh, run it until the end, but since it takes uh, some minutes to, to complete, uh, I already did it and uh, I'm just showing you the same result, the output received result uh, from the file, which is this one. Okay, this is exactly the same output run for every, every single one. So let's jump to the last, uh, last part of it, which is where the comparison success is successfully done. Okay, which is this one. Okay, 
great. Okay, now I see that after this is this is successfully, I see this execution here. So I'm interested in understanding what this part is doing because probably it's what exactly I need to know right now because uh, this is the scope, the function scope at the end. So let's start from the last one, which is probably one uh, which is interesting. So we can get this content and just look for it in our Ghidra. Okay, I can just look for the same value in the code. For example, this one, but this is assigned. So this is not what we are looking for because it's an assignment. This is an assignment. This is an assignment. This is another assignment. Okay, this is the part where it's checked because you have the if here. And you can see that this is just the break and the exit of the loop. So, okay, great. We understood that this part here of the flattening means, okay, breaks the loop and exit to the of, from the function. Okay, great. Good to know, but it's not what we are looking for. So let's go to the second one here and let's try to find what he's doing. So let's look for it. This is the assignment, this is the if. Okay, great. So this is what happening just before the function exit. As you can see, there is a kind of assignment. We don't know for what, because we just now we didn't do anything more than what we did with the resplit. So we didn't analyze anything more or less. And we see that, uh, for example, this is an assignment of, of local 18. And, uh, but we don't know actually what this is doing. So we don't know the content of this part here. So it's not really, clear what is doing. But we can say that uh, local 18, for example, is uh, the function, that the, the, the value that the function is returning and which is, this is very helpful for us. So we saw that by following these things, we saw that uh, just before breaking and exiting, there is an assignment of local 18 to uh, some value, to uh, a, a specific value. Let's go into the calling function here and seeing uh, what happens with this value. So the calling function was, uh, let's go back again and again. Okay, this was the calling function. As you can see, local 18 is assigned to local eight here. And there is a virtual alloc done on that value. Great, we can leverage another um, thing that the Resploit is giving us and the emulation allow us to do, which is the, let's go back. Another option, uh, which is the, let me show it to you, the dash M option here. As before, we use the dash T for dumping thread thread. With the dash M, we can dump the virtual alloc API allocated content on read execor free. So we can just rerun again, run it uh, another time. And uh, with this option here to see what actually was uh, allocated because that was the content of local 18 we saw before. So let's, uh, 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 also in this case, I have a recorded re screencast for uh, for this kind of emulation because it takes uh, four or five minutes to complete. So uh, I just did it uh, beforehand, just not have you looking at the screen for minutes. And uh, at the end, you should take a few seconds again. We will see that uh, there will be a dump of this, uh, of this, uh, okay. Uh, of this virtual alloc here. You can see that it has been dumped in a file. Then I show up the file. Okay, great. This looks like some uh, specific uh, code. And uh, okay, let's uh, now try to summarize and sum up everything. We saw that there was a NTDLL mapping uh, of the file. It, is, it has been loaded in memory. Then there was a, a look for a specific uh, function call and then uh, that the result has been taken. So let's infer what is it. I'm assuming that this is in sometimes getting the code of the empty virtual alloc uh, function. And let's see if it's true. I can uh, open up uh, uh, this in uh, PA bear, which is a tool that allows you to uh, inspect files. And you can see there is, there are, uh, so I opened the, DNT, the NTDLL file here. As you can see, there is an export section where you can see, for example, the in-protect virtual memory, which is the one, the, 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 the function call we are looking for with a, a function address. If we step at this point, we can see here that this is exactly the content of our dump here. So that means that this part of the code, what is, is doing exactly this. So it's getting the image of the file it's looking for a specific function and this copying the content of this function into memory for a later use. Why this is happening? 
I will I, I'll tell you my my take on it in a while. Uh, okay, so let's go back uh, here. So um, let's do it. Okay, this is what we learned by using our emulation approach. We saw a map view of file. Look for the end protect virtual memory. The the get of the content of this address and then a virtual allocation. What I assume is that this DLL is doing a kind of evasion. You know that EDR antivirus are hooking up every single function or every, not every single function, but all the function that can be used to interact with memory. And for example, NT protect virtual memory is one of them. So what this DLL is doing here is just to create a fresh copy and a nuked one in memory of this particular function, because in that case, it can use it later uh, without being intercepted by EVR. So this is a pretty common way to evade uh, EVR and antivirus protection. Uh, as you can so as you can see that uh, we we really get there pretty fast, we, even if it was obfuscated and so on, because we leveraged some of the uh, power that emulation can give us. So let me jump to the conclusion. It was all very fast because we don't have uh, so much time. Uh, then there is there are a lot of other things you can look into the um, this file and uh, a lot of other things you can uh, learn by using emulator and so on. So let me just uh, conclude what, what I want to, to, to tell you today, what I want to do today uh, is that emulation gives you more control on what is the execution flow. As we saw, we can really interact with the code itself. With emulation, you can also reach branches that uh, uh, you cannot reach in another way because I just printed the content of a register with my code, but I can also modify it. So if I can modify the AIX, I can instruct the code to go in another branch, which has not been taken for several reasons. So this is a very powerful way to use emulation. And what I would like to, to tell you today is that, is that, not, that emulation is not good for every kind of analysis. Uh, because uh, sometimes it takes time, sometimes uh, uh, you need to look uh, into very detailed part of the code and so on. But it's very useful when you have very simple situation like the first one. So you had uh, a very simple code to emulate. So it was a matter of minutes to understand what it's doing or a very complex situation like the last one uh, where you want to understand every single uh, bit uh, of what uh, the, the, the DLL is doing. I think that it's a very good things to have in our belts as a malware analyst and so on. So uh, then I'm not saying that this is replacing boxing. So boxing has a lot of other user usage, which are very good for a lot of things, but this is, I think, an additional way to approach a malware analysis that can give you something more and give you more insights on what uh, software is doing. I think that's all. Uh, these are the credits. Uh, so there is also a site here where I placed all the files uh, we use today. And um, sorry, and uh, um, you can get them here. So at me at my GitHub, and also maybe Sakshi will give the, the the presentation to you as well at the end of the the webinar. Uh, okay, that's all. Thank you very much. And for sure, if you have any question, I'm here. Uh, thank you so much, Jen, uh, for this amazing informative session. And if you guys have any questions, uh, please drop them in the chat uh, option. Uh, the one thing, can you share the YouTube link that you uh, uh, that you mentioned on the PPT, I think, at the beginning? Okay, great. Yeah. Can you just add it in the chat box? Because... Uh, we tried using that link, but it wasn't uh, coming up. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. So, thanks for even. <laughs> okay. Uh, so then, let me just read out the questions. Uh, the first is: Can that dot DLL file be shared? Yeah, they are on the um, on the repository I shared at the end. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, how uh, TEB and PEP structures are emulated? Okay, yes, this is this is done by the uh, Speakeasy emulator. Uh, they are creating uh, with Python Python code fake entries for TEB and PEB and everything else uh, needed to emulate uh, things. Consider that uh, this is emulated. Sometimes happens that things are missing, uh, and these, for example, for this kind of emulation, I did a. Um, 
I did job on my uh, on my tool on Resprite and on the upstream tools I use because I'm based on Unicorn and Speakeasy. And sometimes you need to open pull request to that tools to maybe fix things or add things that are missing. So, but everything gets simulated with Python code in this case. Uh, if exception happens during the emulation, will key user exception dispatcher be called? Okay, yes, there are two uh, exceptions. There is an exception handler uh, built in in the speaky simulator, and uh, you can use it, or you can also intercept uh, the, uh, the exception with your own code by modifying it. Okay, and I think we have a last question. Uh, how the emulation can be speeded up? Because you're saying short programs execute for four to five minutes. Which are the blog, main bottlenecks and can it be improved? Uh, yes, I'll okay. Um, Okay, no, short programs uh, like shellcode and so on, it's executed in seconds. Uh, we saw it before at the beginning uh, with the simple, um, simple code is executed in very few seconds. The problem happens more with uh, complex loops. Uh, what, uh, what happens uh, um, sometimes is that, for example, the loops like the one we saw before, the one enumerating all the API in a, in a DLL, it's taking, it's, it's taking some time. Um, this is a kind of uh, bottleneck of emulation because uh, you have to consider that uh, every single call is emulated with uh, an engine uh, behind uh, which can be for example a python engine uh, or something like that so uh, with resploit uh, i'm implement since with resploit uh, i'm also adding several other hooks i implemented that that option dash u to remove them when you have to go uh, fast and you have to um, speed it up then uh, um, uh, there is, in any case, a bottleneck uh, in this part uh, of the, the code. And that's uh, something you have to take into consideration because for sure emulation is lower than having uh, a sandbox. Uh, and it's uh, probably 10 times lower, if, if not more. Uh, but that's the pre price to, 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 to pay for getting the possibility to interact with the code. Uh, probably something can be improved for sure. Uh, but uh, you cannot reach for sure the performances that you get in a, in a sandbox. That's for sure. All right. I think that was the last question. Uh, is it possible for you to uh, share the GitHub link uh, in the chat box as well? And I will sure. share it over the feedback mail. Uh, so all of you will be getting a feedback email. Uh, I will add that link uh, over there as well. Sure. Uh, let me just do it. Okay, this is the link for where all the material has been placed. Uh, so you can get the DLLs and files and so on. And okay, remember that if you want to have open a, to, to use it or you, have, you want to get in touch with me, you are free to do it, open an issue, get in touch with me on uh, Twitter as you prefer. Uh, I will be very happy to work with you in improving things or just discussing things as you, as you want, okay? Awesome, uh, thank you, Cesare, uh, once again. Thank you for joining, bye. Bye, thank you.